Luke's gospel, chapter 16. In this year of the pressers, we are pressing uh, into the kingdom. We are excited about being saved. We're glad that we're washed in the blood, and we celebrate our relationship with the Lord. We're saved and glad about it, not saved and mad about it. We're proud of our walk with Christ, and we want to get closer to him. Amen? Closer to him. All right, if you have Luke's Gospel, chapter 16, say, I have it. Uh, it reads as, let's see, why don't I do this to save a little time? I'm going to read verse 14 and 15, then we're going to backtrack a little while. Is that all right? Verse 14 and 15 says this, And the Pharisees also, who were covetous. All right? You got to get that. And the Pharisees, is verse 14 of Luke's Gospel, chapter 16. And the Pharisees also, who were covetous. Let me re read it again. And the Pharisees also, who were greedy. Heard all the things, all these things, and they derided him. Uh, to deride, saints, is to laugh at, to ridicule, to, <laughs> to, to, to laugh, to, to, to scorn. Uh, uh, I mean, they were just bawling, man, at Jesus' teachings. They found, they treated Jesus like he was a regular Jack Benny or uh, some comedian or somebody. And they, I, can, I can hear him just laughing after the Lord had finished giving a teaching. Uh, and, 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 and check this out. And Jesus wasn't, wasn't trying to be funny. And as they laughed at him, he said this, as they just stood there and laughed. And he said unto them, you are they which justify yourselves before men. But God knoweth your hearts, for that which is highly esteemed among men is abomination in the sight of God. What a response. I bet they stopped laughing then. And then it went on and said, and the law and the prophets were unto John. Since that time, the kingdom of God is preached, and men everywhere press into it. Verse 15 says, for that which is highly esteemed, that which is hoopselos is the uh, Greek word. That is lofty, held in high uh, elevation, that is highly appreciated among men, is abomination. Bedeluma, 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 that is disgusting. Bedeluma, it is desecration. It is loathing in the sight of God. Look at the contradiction here. You see, esteemed among men, abominable or disgusting in the sight of God. I want to teach tonight from the subject, aligning with God, aligning with, with God. Father, bless us now as we study the word of the Lord together. In Jesus' name, amen. Everybody say, aligning, aligning. with God. Now, without running, well, I'm going to run the risk of insulting your intelligence. Bless you, honey. I'm going to. But I, 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 I'm going to give you a definition, and I, know you, and I know you know, but for the two or three out there who may not know, uh, to align is to bring into a straight line. Um, to bring into proper coordination. To align. To bring into proper coordination. To, uh, to fall in line. To line up with. Amen. So I want to talk to you tonight about becoming into proper coordination with God. Amen. To fall in line with God. 
Now, the Bible says this concerning our need to align ourselves with the God of the Bible. Uh, in 1 Samuel chapter 16 and verse 7 says, But the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. He may look like a king. He may appear to be a king. He may have the height and the stature of a king. But God says that's only on the exterior. That's superficial. He says to Samuel, don't pay any attention to that because I have refused him. And then God says this to him, for the Lord seeth not as man seeth. God doesn't look at things the way we do. For man looketh on the outward appearance, but God looketh on the heart. I think it's worth, I think it's worth repeating. I want to emphasize uh, that phrase right there uh, in the, the B clause of verse 7. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth. You can't, you can't decide who you're going to marry based, based on his or her shape his or her stature or lack thereof. Amen. You, you, can't, you, you can't make decisions based on the outward appearance. People have, and they've messed up big time. Amen. Sometimes the very thing, the very one, or the very thing that God has for you is the thing that doesn't look like it would be the one that God has for you. You go on the car lot, and you see all the cars you like, and, and, and sometimes the very one that may not appeal to you is the one that God has anointed for you. And if you go there and you go after it without prayer, you may pick the prettiest one on the lot and you may have picked the, the, the most beautiful lemon ever made. The thing could be a floodplain car. Everything's rotten in it. That's why it's so beautiful sitting there with low mileage. <laughs> Ten miles on the speed. Of That's because when they bought it three days later, uh, the thing flooded. And now it's your car and they can't, they, it lives in the shop. When the Lord pointed at that car, uh, the, right down three, three or four cars down, it wasn't as pretty. It didn't shine as beautifully, but it would give you about ten, uh, six years, uh, seven years, or, or even longer of impeccable service. This is why with everything we do, we need to ask God to show us the way. Don't, hey, look, let me tell you something. You have, to, you have to look and pray before you leap. You have to talk to God and talk to God. And then not just talk to the Lord. The Bible teaches that in the multitude of counsel, there is safety. When people come to me and they tell me things, I, I listen. I listen uh, for, based on the way they talk. Am I being informed or is my counsel being uh, sought? If I'm being informed, I just say, okay. If my counsel is being sought, then I give my opinion. Amen. But I don't like giving it unsolicited. But pastor, the Lord told me to do thus and so. I'm waiting for what do you think about it, man of God? Or what is the Lord saying to you? If I don't get that, I don't tell you what I think. But if I get that, then I can tell you. It depends. And, and you know what? You got to deal with the Lord that way. You can't come. as a saying that says, do you want to make God laugh? Walk up to him and tell him what your plans are. You can't, you can't tell God what your plans are. He knows. You got to ask the Lord, is this all right, Lord, is this what you would have me to do? For the Lord seeth not as man seeth. Isaiah chapter 55, verse 8 through 9 says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways uh, than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. So not only are God's ways not our ways, uh, nor his thoughts, our thoughts, but God's ways and God's thoughts are superior to our ways and our thoughts. So it's not that God's ways and thoughts are just different, but God's ways and thoughts are superior. Now that we can see then that our, way, our ways, our way of thinking, our behavior are not the same as our Heavenly Father's, then there is a definite need tonight for an alignment on our part. God doesn't have to adjust his position. Amen. We've got to adjust ours. You know, the Lord's not going to fall in line with me. I got to fall in line with him. 
The way I make sure that God and I are on the same page is I find out what page God's on. And I get on God's page. He doesn't have to find out what page I'm on. I don't have a page. <laughs> Look at your neighbor and say, you don't have a page. See, only God has a page. So we got to, we got to get on, 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 on God's page and, and line up with God. This is why Bible study is so important. This is why uh, corporate Bible study, like what we're having right now, is so important because you need to be taught for, with, from someone who has authority. It can't be just a, you know, these other things have their place, but it can't be a free-for-all. You know, people like that now. We all sit around, everybody's equal, and we all have our own opinions, and you never even find out what the Bible actually says or what it means. That, that has its place, but it can't take the place of a set man standing and teaching the Word of God according to the Scripture. You'd be surprised at the churches that have abandoned this model. And they've abandoned the thing that God said people can't hear without. The Bible says, how can you hear without a preacher? How can they preach except they be sent? The Bible doesn't say, how can you hear without a small group? How can you hear without a preacher? There has to be an authority. Now, I just said there are place, there's a place for these other things. But you can't redo God's order. When Jesus got ready to teach, in the synagogue, everybody listen. He taught, they listen. Well, in our church, we don't have teaching. We just have discussion, and we have donuts, and we have coffee, and it's just a wonderful time. And you know what? You probably know nothing about your doctrine. You probably know nothing about the doctrine of Christianity. A study was done of all the major religions in the world, the most illiterate people of all religions in terms of knowing what it is they believe, the most illiterate are Christians. Christians don't know what Christians believe because Christians do not study the Bible. Oh, and then many times when we do, we don't study the Bible to learn what the Bible says. We study the Bible to learn what we need to know to get out of whatever it is we're in so that the Lord can get us through whatever the latest uh, quagmire or rut is. Say amen. Um, in studying the scriptures, this is something that we have to do. We learn two things. And I've talked to you about this before. If you're making, if you if you are taking notes, write it down. Two things you got to know as a believer. You got to know the truth of God and the truth about God truth of God and the truth about God. Truth of the God of the Bible and the truth about the God of the Bible. The truth of God, which is God's truth, is God's views on things. God's positions on things. What the Lord has to say about everything. God's I don't want to say God's opinion because what God thinks is, is law. But God's position on what's right and wrong. God's position on right and wrong. God's position on morality. God's position on good and evil. God's position on what marriage, what constitutes a marriage. God's position on what constitutes a family. God's position. God's position on what is truth. And what is not? Amen. Not just something we pull out the air or not just something that someone else says and all that. No, we want to know what God says. This is the truth of God. The truth about God is God's teachings on what kind of God he is. You need to know who you serve. We need to know about his essence, his character, his greatness, his might, his power, that he is a holy God. Many of us have been saved by him. We know him in the sense that we've accepted him, but we don't know him in the sense of having sought him and, and gotten to know him and, 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 and have put forth the time and effort in getting to know him according to the scripture. 
So when trouble comes and hard times come and all that, we come, we, we come unglued. We don't handle situations well. We don't go through death well. We don't go through a bad diagnosis well. We don't go through trouble well because we behave as though that we don't know that he's faithful. And, and we behave as though that we, don't, that we don't know that he's faithful because the truth is we don't know him. So we don't know that he's faithful. We begin to behave just like the world. Next thing you know, the saints drink it. The saints smoking, the saints cussing, the saints fighting because we say we know him, but we don't. So the believer has got to get to know the truth of God and the truth about God. And you can only find these things. The main place, rather, that you can find these things is in the scripture and doing exactly what you're doing right now. As the man of God, teach the word of God to you. You're, 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 you're taking it in and reading alone. It is the doctrine of the identity of God. The truth about God is the doctrine of the identity God, of, of God. And the truth uh, of God is the doctrine of how we should, uh, how he would have us to live. Amen. And when you know the truth about God, you know what? You don't get confused about this crazy stuff you see going on today. When you know these things, you're not moved by all of these movements and the, the craziness uh, and the wickedness uh, that, is, that, is, that is going on in society. Knowing God keeps you from these things. Romans 1 and 19 speaks, speaks of, uh, uh, of that which um, may be known of God. And see, the wonderful thing about the God of the Bible is that he has made us, made, uh, uh, us to know him, to uh, given us the things that we need to know concerning his identity and standards, and they're, writ they're in the preaching of the gospel and in the Bible. You see Romans chapter 1 and verse 19, isn't that an interesting verse? You see that? It says, for that which might be known of God is revealed in them, because that which may be known of God, that is, that which is knowable. Everything about the God who made everything is not knowable at this time. David said, such things are too high for me. None of us can know everything that there is to be known about God. There is not enough room on the planet to... Uh, 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 deal with the volumes of the books that should be written about Christ and what he did on this planet in just three years of ministry. Amen. James says, uh, 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 in, uh, John said this in John chapter 21 and verse 25, he says, and there are also many other things which Jesus did, the which if they should be written, everyone, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. Amen. Amen. Now, he, he's talking about the things that Jesus did from 30 to 33. He said, if all those things were documented, there's no place, there's no computer that could hold what he did. What a mighty God we serve. So there's a whole lot about God that we don't know. But everything that we need to know to keep us here on this earth and to get us to heaven and to give us power to overcome the devil and power to walk in victory, all of that is revealed in the gospel and in the preaching and the teaching of the word of God. God is knowable because he made, made it possible for himself to be known. So, it's time for us to align ourselves with God as never before for, because that which is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of the Lord. Now, to make this point, the Lord gives a parable. 
And this parable is the parable of uh, the unrighteous steward. This is so interesting. And uh, we're, go we're going to read the text and, and, and see um, some things because uh, among the things that we're going to establish is when the parable starts and when the where the parable ends and uh, uh, the importance of understanding this parable. Are you with me? It says in verse 1, and he said unto his disciples, there was in a certain, there was a certain, let's look at the characters, number one, rich man. That was an owner. Okay? Which had a steward. That is, he had an estate manager. A rich, wealthy man who hired someone to manage his estate, all right? And the same, the, this manager was accused unto him that had, uh, that it was accused unto him that he had wasted his goods. Somebody brought an accusation to the rich man that the steward whom he hired to manage his affairs, had wasted his um, affairs, his goods, all right? And he called him, the rich man called the steward, and said unto him, how is it that I hear this of thee? Give an account of thy stewardship, for thou mayest be no longer a steward. He says, what is this that I hear about you? Give me an account of your stewardship because I am about to let you go. Then the steward said within himself. Now what's funny is, and, and I want to bring this out because it's very important that we get this as I lay this foundation. The, the, the steward uh, doesn't defend himself against the accusations. He doesn't, uh, in the text, try to convince the, uh, his boss that he's not guilty. Someone will say, well, that's because he was guilty. Well, we're going we're gonna to look at some things that might bring that assumption into question. All right? You're not saying anything. All right, so we're gonna, you're going to follow me now. Uh, so let, let me keep reading. And because uh, I, I got to keep my eyes on the time because we got to go to Rockingham tomorrow night. Say amen. So, <laughs> and so he called him and said, now I'm, I'm, I'm getting ready to fire you. Then the steward, notice who he talks to, said within himself, what shall I do? For my Lord taketh away from me the stewardship. Man, I'm white collar. I'm a white-collar worker. I cannot dig. I am no ditch digger. I am a business manager. I push pencils and pens for a living. Figures. I tell, you know, I know how to arrange his staff. Uh, going out digging a hole stuff, that ain't me. So he says, to dig, I cannot dig. And, and, and then he says this, and to beg, I am ashamed. I can't beg. I, I can't dig, but I, I can't beg either. I'm not going to, I'm not going to be, a, uh, I can't dig ditches, but I'm not going to be a beggar. I'm not going to be anybody's charity case. Okay? He says, I am resolved on what to do. I got it. I got it. I got it. That, when I am put out of the stewardship, they, the people, may receive me into their house. I know what I will do to make some friends so that when I no longer have a job, I'll have somewhere to stay. Because in those days, government didn't provide housing. Amen. So, and so he called every one of his Lord's debtors unto him and said unto the first, how much owest thou uh, unto my Lord? How much do you owe the boss? And the man said, a hundred measures uh, of oil. And he said unto him, take thy bill and sit down quickly and write 50. Here, here's the receipt. Here's the bill. We're going to cut the price by 50%. 
All right? Now, then said he to another, How much owest thou? And he said unto him, A hundred measures of wheat. And he said unto him, Take thy bill and write four score. We're going to cut the bill. Are you following? Say amen. And then he gets, and, and, and look at this. And the Lord, the rich man, the owner, commended, instead of firing, he gave accommodation to the unjust steward because he had done according to uh, the Lord, small or L-O-R-D, according to the Lord, uh, he had done wisely. Or, according to the Lord, it says, verse 8 says, and the Lord commended the unjust steward. Now, put your finger right there. Before we go any further, this is where the parable ends. Now, the rest of the verses, it's not the parable. The rest of the verses is the lesson we're going to learn from the parable. But the parable ends abruptly. It stops on a dime. It stops with the unjust steward receiving big time commendations. So the man goes from being on his way out to being right back in the game. And it closes on a high note for him. And here's what it does. Here's what it does. It closes, the, the, uh, the parable closes with Everybody aligned and everybody happy. We know that the rich man was happy because he accommodated, gave accommodation. We know that the people who owed the man was happy because their bill was cut in half. See, whereas they weren't paying anything, he made it, he made it cheap so that they could pay. They're happy. Praise the Lord. Because now, they're, they're not like some who, who wouldn't be happy unless they just didn't pay anything. So you got a character problem with that. So something wrong with you. Somebody help you out and bless you and all that, and you're supposed to pay them back, and you don't give them anything. There's something wrong with your character. There's something wrong with your spirit. Say amen. amen. And, and that'll come back to haunt you. Because the Lord will fix it where you'll need something else. Amen. And stuff like that vex people. There you go to new boots, new shoes, new car, new hairdo, new nails, new socks, new everything. And you hadn't paid. <laughs> Man watching you shop with, with, with his necktie on. So that's my necktie money. Oh, stuff like that will vex your spirit. I was talking to a lady the other day. I don't, I don't remember talking to a, uh, a Holly in, in life. And, and just out the blue, she started bringing up... Uh, of uh, uh, what uh, one of her loved ones, how one of her loved ones got her. And uh, she said, I gave them some money, and they wouldn't even pay me back. And I said, Pastor, the bad thing about it was, there wasn't anyone up here, bad thing about it was, the person was owing me, and they started treating me funny. I said, yeah, that's the way they'll do you. Owe you money, and stop speaking to you. I, now you know, now you know, now you know something's going on now. You owe me and won't speak to me. You done got funny, but you owe me. How you going to do that? So that's when you need all the oil. He'll know if my head with oil, you need all the oil poured on you. <laughs> oh, you don't hear me tonight. All right. Now, keep in mind, some of you can't laugh because you're guilty. So I ask God to give you some credit, some character, and go to the person you owe, apologize for being wicked, and say, I'm going to make it right. That's all. Don't sit there and try to get dignified when you know you're wrong. When the word finds you, you just repent. Well, it's amazing what happens. Word finds you, oh, God, the word found me. Oh, Lord, forgive me, Lord. Help, Jesus. Touch me right now. I got, I got found out tonight in the word of God. That's all. That's all you got to do. Don't give yourself a weight. That's right. <laughs> yeah, you did it. 
Keep in mind what a parable is. A parable is a comparison of a spiritual thing to a natural thing that the spiritual thing might be better understood. A parables both conceal and reveal truth. It depends on, remember Sunday? It depends on where you are spiritually. If you're not where you should be spiritually, the parable will hide the truth from you. If you're where you should be spiritually, the parable will cause you to see the truth. You met people who just can't get it, they can't get it, they can't get it. No matter what you teach and preach to them, they just misunderstand. That's because spiritually they're not where they should be and, and they're, they're dull of hearing. There are other people who just get it just like that, just like that, just like that. Through you, soon you throw it out. Oh, Oh, I see what he's saying. That's because spiritually you're in the right place. And the parable, it will, it's going to blind some of you and, and it's going to open somebody else's eyes. It depends on where you are spiritually and how you pay attention and how badly you want to understand the things of God. That's the way they work. So now, here's the, the parable. So the parable is not, most of the time, uh, the, the truth that's being taught in the parable is not necessarily uh, what the parable is, the, the parable itself. It's, it's the lesson that you are to learn from it. Are you following me? So we, we learn, first of all, that this parable ends at verse 8. Now, a few other points, and, and time just runs out on me, um, that, that you, we need to at least take a look at. If you, just, just for the sake of, you know, wanting to be correct, if you, if you look in verse 1, verse 1 tells us that the steward, the manager, the steward, and, and, and this steward was not in just any ordinary household servant, but he was an estate manager. He was an agent of his master's estate. He, he handled all of the economic affairs of this rich man. He had a key job. Whoever handles your money, Amen. That's, 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 that's a big job. That's a big job. Amen. That's, 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 that's second only to who watches over your soul. Say amen. So, uh, oh yeah, that's, that's way up there. And uh, 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 this man had a very important job. Now, the scripture teaches that he was accused. Now, if you study this word accused, the word is dialobos. Dialobos come from dialobo. Uh, well, it's dialobo. It comes from dialobos, which is uh, the devil. If you study the Greek word for this, it teaches that the, the man was not necessarily accused, but falsely accused. Dia Bolo, falsely accused. Dia Bolo, falsely accused. Now, we can argue that point all day, which is not the point of the parable. See, but I like to bring these things out because I know you study too, and there are different things out there in the debates uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the in the schools of those who study in the, the, the theological circles. So I don't want you to think that we're, we're, we're not aware of it. So, so, we, so whether he, he did it or not, whether he did it or not, that's not the point here. But I, I wanted to throw that in just, just to, to get you to thinking. All right? So now, uh, also I want you to look at, uh, he says, when I am put out. When I am put out. This parable has eternal implications because put out comes from a, a Greek word that was used, which literally means to be taken out of this world and put into the next. So the parable is not just about uh, being fired from a job. It has eternal implications from this world to the next. Now, the hearers of the parable at the time understood. All right? So uh, over the years and things been written, this may get lost on us as we're studying it. But the audience understood the implications that, uh, of what the man was saying when he was saying, okay, now what should I do when I am put out, when, when I leave here? It was, uh, it was a double message when I, uh, it, it applies to here and it applies to there. Are you following me? And also the word debts, 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 
applies to the debts of the parable, but debts can also mean sins. The forgiveness of debts, the forgiveness of sin. We, when we pray the Lord's Prayer, Lord, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lord, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us. Both apply. Are you following me? So, uh, uh, the, so if this man uh, helped these people in their lives get their debts removed, if we look at natural debts, then anyone who, who helped alleviate your debt load, that person means something to you if your spirit is right. You're appreciative to that individual if they help uh, relieve your debt load. Well, if someone wins you to Christ and helps you, helps relieve your sin load, that person means a lot to you if your heart's in the right place. Praise the Lord. I was talking to somebody about Elder Turner on my way to church, and, and I said, the man of God's been in heaven for 30 years, but I talk about him all the time because he gave me the gift that just keeps on giving. He won my soul to Christ. Praise the Lord. And if I live for another 10 years or another 20 years or another 30 years, you'll hear me talking about Elder Turner. Elder Turner. Won't ever not talk about Elder Turner. See, because he took away uh, my debts. Jesus saved me, but he's the one in his preaching who made me want Jesus. Praise the Lord. And then after having gotten saved, his preaching style made me want to stay with Jesus. So that endears him to me for the rest of my days. Say amen. So uh, uh, now, get these little things. And, uh, and, and so the, 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 he's talking about what happens if you're put out. The, we see that this man made a move that if he lost his job, he would have somewhere to stay. The people would say to him, come stay with me. Stay as long as you like because you certainly helped. But it has heavenly implications that says when you die, depending upon how you manage your life, depending upon how you manage your money, depending upon what you do to promote the kingdom, there will be those in heaven waiting for you. See, it has earthly implications and it has heavenly implications. Amen. One writer said that uh, depending upon how you manage your financial affairs, it will, it will speak to your worthiness to enter into the kingdom. So someone said, well, is that not salvation by works? No, it's not salvation by works, but it is salvation with works. With works. See, with your salvation, your salvation, once you get saved, everything in your life ought to line up around that decision. It's amazing how when we get saved, the only thing that got saved was our souls. It didn't change what we watch on TV. It didn't, didn't change who we hang with. It didn't change where we go. It didn't, it didn't change our behavior. It didn't change anything. Well, you ask yourself, then what got saved? If it doesn't change anything, nothing's happened. Well, you hooked on drugs before you got saved, still hooked on drugs. Praise the Lord. At the, at, the, at the bartender, at the bar drinking before you met Jesus, still sitting at the bar drinking. Well, what got saved? Into pornography before Jesus and got, got all the pornos since Jesus. The question becomes, what got saved? But once you get saved, there, there comes an alignment. You're not with me tonight. There comes an alignment. It is supposed to affect everything else. And, then, and that, that process, the process of alignment is called sanctification. Amen. Getting right with God. I'm born again now, so now I want everything in my life to reflect that decision. So we see uh, that with this man, that when this guy got the news that he was going to be terminated, the man went and came up with a good plan. He was wise. He was prudent. And he calls the, the people to be blessed. And instead of getting fired, he got commended. Verse 8 now. Let's go to verse 8. Are you with me? Everybody say verse 8. Verse eight. 
So now in the eighth verse, and the Lord, small L-O-R-D, commend, commended the unjust steward. Why did he commend him? Because he had done wisely. Now watch Jesus' comment on it. He, Jesus says, now the parable is over. Jesus says, for the children of this world are in their generation wiser than the children of light. That is, for the children of this world, worldly people, are much more shrewd when dealing with each other in financial affairs than the saints are. That's what he said. See, because he's dealing with a worldly thing. His point is not financial affairs, but he's using that to make a point. He says, for the children of the world, they're wise. They understand this kind of, you know, business. Where they understand business language. If you've never been in business, you know, it's amazing to me sometimes folk who have never been in business would try to have business conversations with folk who run businesses. And they talk with the same authority, but you've never run a business. If you never run anything, you can't speak to someone with the same authority who actually have run something. Praise you can't do that. You, you've never practiced law, but you're going to teach the lawyer the law. You've never been to law school in the day, but you're telling the doctor what's wrong. No, here's how you fix this. There's something wrong with that. Never pastored, but you're going to tell the pastor how to pastor. Something's wrong with that. Amen. So he says, now, I, I can't get many amens tonight for some reason. I, I don't know what it is. Maybe I'm not teaching good. He says, for the children of this world are wiser uh, with, with, with their own than the children of light. Then he says this, I say unto you, because what he, and, and, and the wiser is also, he, 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 was, he was referencing back the moves that this guy made. How he went, cut the bill, and fixed it where, whereas the owner was getting nothing, now he's getting something. And then some say that what he actually took off was, those who argue that he was actually unjust, is that the price was, the, the debt was double what it should, been because, should have been because he was charging them that much interest. And in the rabbinical teachings, you were not supposed to charge interest at all. If you would loan someone money, remember the Bible says, and he that uh, put out his money but not uh, to usury, you get in trouble with God. You're not supposed to. Believers aren't supposed to uh, amongst ourselves. Uh, now, if you go to a lending institution, that's one thing, but you, your brother or your sister come to you and say, I need you to bless me. Will, will you loan me $20? Then you say, well, I'll, I'll lend you $20, but you got to pay me 25 back. Well, God's going to get you for that. You're not supposed to do that. We don't put out our money for uh, a usury. No, no, no. You, they, they loaned you $20. They, they, they owe you $20. They owe you $20. They owe you $21, and they don't owe you $19.95. They owe you $20. Amen. So that's, that's the reference there. But then he gives them advice. He says, and I say unto you, make to yourselves friends of the riches of the mammon of unrighteousness. Now the Lord was not calling money mammon of unrighteousness, which is money or riches. He wasn't calling it evil in and of itself. The reference mammon of unrighteousness, he calls it that because it's so easy to do wrong with it. It's so easy to do wrong with it with it. See, money has to be managed. In the African-American community, one of, the, one of the great things that most African-American, we black preachers have done, we've done a good job in teaching our members down through the years on how to serve God and how to deal with poverty. We didn't do a good job teaching them how to deal with having money. Amen. So because some of us get crazy when we come into some money. Oh, it changes everything. Praise the Lord. Jesus can't even tell us what to do. Uh, it just, but because money carries a spirit. Now, uh, some of us, when we're struggling, and, and oh, my Lord, and struggling, and, and couldn't hardly make it, never missed a service. Oh, my Lord. We, we, oh, we're having prayer tonight. There you are. And everything, there you are. The Lord blessed you with, with some money, and then you find, oh, oh, there's just so many other places you you have to go now. Lord, 
There's, there's so many other things to see and the other things I want to do. Uh, uh, praise the Lord. I can't be there all the time now. I, I want to see the world. And, and we're blessed to see you. But when you don't have it, now you're back in another place. So it, it carries a spirit. It carries a spirit. So you have, to be, you, have to be, you have to be anointed to know how to handle what God has put in your hands because that money will handle you if you don't know how to handle it. Amen. It can destroy your home. It can destroy your, your business. It can destroy your anointing because it gives you a God complex. You think that the rules don't apply to you. First thing that money does is money will make you think you're better than everyone else or at least better than everyone who don't have the, um, uh, as much money as you have. It can do that. You have to remind yourself right quick that, you, that it doesn't. As the Lord bless you, get on your knees. Get on your knees the more. You should be the, you should be the first one in prayer. Why? Because you're loaded. And you got to fight that spirit of pride and fight that spirit that makes you feel secure in your bank account. See, we get in trouble when you trust in wealth. When you were in poverty, you easily trusted in God. Well then, and uh, well now, you got the trust because the devil will tell you when, when you get blessed to a certain level, you don't need God. You won't, you won't admit it. You won't say it out loud, but your behavior will say, I don't need God. I don't, what, what do I need to pray for? What do I need to fast for? What do I need to seek the Lord for? Shucks, everything I want, I can just go buy. But there are some things that money can't buy. There are some things that money can't control. And one of them is your spirit. Because then what happens is it creates a monster. It creates a monster. And you become the Frankenstein monster. And you do things. And, uh, and uh, the monster ends up, every time you watch it, the monster gets killed. So, look at this. He says to them, make friends to yourself with the mammon of unrighteousness. That when you fall, that is when you die. Everybody in here is going to die. See, isn't it amazing that when we die, that one of the things that will be called into uh, reckoning is how we managed our money. And in particular, what you did to help promote the press into the kingdom. I have a good turnout tonight. You wouldn't know it by my amens, but I do. Now, he says here, when you fall, that they may receive you into everlasting habitation. Now, into everlasting is, talk, is not talking about here. Oh, no. Oh, no. Everlasting. No, 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 no. There's nothing here everlasting. There's nothing here everlasting. He says, when you die, everlasting habitation is not your address here. I don't care if the, the Lord bless you to live on Rodeo, Rodeo Drive. You're not going to stay there. Where I'm going, you're going to die. Everybody is. So, and, and you're going to get to everlasting habitation. He says here, I, I wish I could get more amens, uh, that when they fall, they may receive. Now, the reference to the they are the debtors, the people that he just talked about in the parable, who owed the master, who got their debts relieved. They became the unjust steward's friend. And if the steward lost his job, they would gladly receive him into the house. So he says, when you die, make sure you've ordered your affairs in such a manner that there will be people up there who will be glad to see you coming in because they'll be able to say, due to your generosity, I got saved. Or oh, due to your work at the, at, the, at the clinic, I 
My life was spared, and I grew up to know Jesus, and now I'm in heaven just because of you. Or so forth and so on. I, I was at the homeless shelter, and you came along and told me about the Lord. I was lost, and you witnessed to me. I was going through, and you took time with me. The church put on an effort to do something, and you gave to it. You never met me. We never talked. But that effort caused me. I heard, I heard the radio. I heard the preacher. And I got saved. I got delivered. I was down and out. But the, the broadcast that was paid for by the tithe and the offerings of the saints of the church, and you were one of them, that helped me get saved. I just want to walk up to you and say thank you. That's what he's saying here. Then he goes to the next lesson. Here on earth. He says, he that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. That which is least, no matter how much money, no matter what the amount is, what God views as least is money. I don't care if you got a million dollars. God puts it in your hand. He wants to, he's going to judge you. He'd want to see how you handle that. That will determine how you handle that which belongs, that which is much. Now, I'm going to show you something. He that will, he that will be faithful in the least. Now, what is, God, what is God saying? I have an anointing right here. I have power right here. Praise the Lord. I have another spiritual level for you right here. I have depth to show you. But before I give it to you, I'm going to test you. Here's a barrel full of money. Now, I'm going to stand back and see what you do with that money, that advantaged position that I've just put you in. Will you stay faithful? Will you still come to church? Will you still pray? Will you give to help the poor? Will you give to help other people? Or will you consume it all on yourself? I'll watch and see what happens to you. Will you still be the same person or will you become a ogre? Will you become an arrogant person because you've gotten, I bless you. I want to see what you're going to do with it because if you're faithful with that, I'll give you much. Because I have some things. I have some things I want to do. I have some things that I want to give you that are more powerful than money. Because let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. Uh, during the, during the, uh, 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 when the Germans invaded the Jews uh, and, and, and Germany, Hitler, uh, let me tell you, there were people during that time and, and in World War I a different time, there were people who would bring barrels of money to the store, a, a wheelbarrow full of money to get a loaf of bread. Because all of a sudden, now it has no value. Yeah. The value system has changed. If you're sick and you need a miracle, oh, and you need a miracle, the, uh, the, the richest man right, can't help you. Amen. Billionaires die. Millionaires die. Yes, they do. Owners of teams die. And after people have said all they got to say, you know what they do? They do the same thing to them that you do to a poor man. You put them in the ground. Say, but 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 the ma the mausoleum is fancy. It's the ground. It's the ground. <laughs> Movie stars die. Can I get a witness? I'm running out of time. I'm running. I'm out of time. Listen, look. Let me just. Let me just. He says, if you're faithful in that which is least, you'll be faithful in much. He that is unjust in that which is least will be unjust in much. If I can't trust you, if I can't trust you with a dollar, I'm not, I'm not giving you no spirit of prophecy. I'm not, I'm not giving you a, the, the, the word of knowledge. I can't trust you with, to be able to look at someone and see the secrets in their lives. Because you're a blab. You can't, you can't keep anything. You're too undisciplined. So I can't, I can't, uh -uh. no, I can't anoint you like Paul. Mm -mm. Cause you won't, you, you can't wait to tell it. <laughs> Look at this. Therefore, if you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, there it is again. Who will commit to your trust 
true riches? Oh, the answer is nobody. And if you have not been faithful in that which is another man's, who will give you that which is your own? If you're not a faithful steward, if you had not been faithful with that which I put in your hands for me, see, if you, if you hadn't been faithful with what the church has given you to do, see, it, it, well, uh, well uh, I'll get there if I, when I get ready. I, I don't care what the pastor says. If they see me, they better be glad to see me. Oh, is that your approach? Is that, is that, is that the way you treat the house of God? Is that your approach? You, you get here when you get here? That's that the way you serve God? You, 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 if, you, if, if we see you, we see you. We don't, we don't. You don't have to. Praise the Lord. You don't give it your all. Is that the way you do, God? He says, all right, you'll never have that which is your own. Everything is a test. Praise the Lord. I'm checking you out, saith the Lord. I want you to align. I want you to line up so I can bless you. And then he said, no servant can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. But you cannot serve God and mammon too. If you, now, he didn't say you couldn't serve God and have mammon. See, people say, well, the Bible speaks against money. No, he didn't say you couldn't have it. He just said you can't serve it. And what, what does he say? You have to master it. And you master what it will try to do to you. It will make you think that you're better. So I was talking to someone just the other day. They said to me, you know, I thought that you were arrogant. I said, uh, why? Well, 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 you've, you, you, you've accomplished so much. Now, I felt bad for a minute now. And I didn't even talk to this person. I don't know if I've talked to this person. In, I don't know if I've talked to him ever. So it just, just sized me up. And I said, I said well, ma'am, I said, I'll tell you this. Listen. I said, uh, accomplishments don't make one person better than another. Because the Lord had blessed me to do a thing or two. That doesn't make me, that's, that's no reason to be arrogant or to think I'm better than someone else because I'm not. At the end of the day, I'm, we're all human beings. We're all down here. We're all the Lord's children. Amen. And, and we, we talked a little while, you know, and, 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 and went on. Uh, I, I'm glad I understood that. So at the close of this great teaching. Great teaching. You know what the Pharisees do? Now, did anybody see any humor in what I just read? Do you think that this was a serious subject that Jesus was preaching? See, I'm talking about responses. Remember? See, it depends on how you hear it. There are those of us who are oppressors, and there are, there are others who are not interested. Now, I, I didn't see anything from verse 1 to verse 13, that was remotely funny. I didn't see a joke line. I didn't see Jesus trying to be a Richard Pryor. Oh, what's that little short guy? Kevin Hart. I didn't see Jesus trying to be him. Say amen. And yet the Pharisees, the religious leaders thought it was funny. They heard what our Lord had to say about arranging your finances to help you get a welcoming committee in heaven. They heard what our Lord had to say about arranging your finances so as to promote the kingdom. Oh, man, they're bawling like, Jerry, like Jesus was Jerry Lewis or somebody. And they're just laughing and laughing. And, laugh. and you know why they laugh? The text tells us why. See, your response to God's word reflects where your heart is. It tells us why. Because they were covetous. There was nothing wrong with what Jesus said. It was them. And, and, to, and, and to be covetous, covetousness, covetous is not a buzzword for wealthy. See, poor people covet just like rich people do. Covetousness knows no class. Praise the Lord. To covet means literally to long for that which belongs to another. 
What do you think is at the heart of all this lottery stuff? Here the covetousness. People are dreaming, but this one dollar, one dollar, if I get it, be one dollar. There you go in line, hoping, hoping the saints don't come. <laughs> Looking all around, hoping that you're going to hit it big. It's a tax for the stupid. They found a way to tax you and, 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 and get you to participate and, uh, and have you feeling good about it. All that money they raised. Hallelujah. I'd rather pay my tithe than my offerings. Amen. Call it a day. And Jesus said this. And I'm done. You are they which justify yourselves. Because before men. See, because he knew their heart. These guys, verse 14 says, and the Pharisees also who were covetous. Covetous. That is, they wanted to keep everything they had. Jesus looked at them and said, you justify yourself. Notice, they didn't say, forgive me. They didn't say, I see myself. They do like many of us do. After service, I, I heard what the pastor said. I heard what he said. I heard, I heard, I heard what he said. But you know, honey, I, I you know, I, I got my opinion too. And, and and I don't agree with that. I heard what he said. You justify yourself. No hope for people who do that. Things can't change for you. The Lord won't bless you because you're not receiving it. See how far to get you. See how far to get you. See what it'll do for you. Amen. And he says, you justify yourself, but God knows your heart. And he says, and for that which is highly esteemed among men, in this case, covetousness. In this case, hoarding, taking your money and having everything to do with it except the kingdom. It's certainly not teaching taking your money and putting it all in the kingdom because you got to live. You got to have a family, raise children, all the things that God wants you to do. Go on vacation, do all the nice things that the Lord bless you to do. But you don't do that at the expense of the kingdom. Amen. Amen. Because the kingdom-minded people are soul-minded people. And, and amongst covetous people, what covetous people esteem, they, they admire people who are covetous and who are just like them, and that's what they like. And yet that that whole line of thinking is an abomination to the Lord. We're living in a day, and I went long, forgive me, 11 minutes over time. We're living in a day now where men have began to admire that which God calls abominable. We're now admiring a man who thinks he's a woman. We admire homosexuality. We admire two men calling themselves married and two women calling themselves married. And people from the Supreme Court all the way down, people are showing uh, admiration for people. Uh, to, I, 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 someone sent me something uh, where they are calling uh, abortion um, uh, uh, a blessing. That in, in, in the state of uh, Connecticut, they, they bought billboards. They bought be, they bought billboards and they and they're putting billboards up along the road that says abortion is a blessing. And everybody who votes for certain politicians who vote a certain way, I won't name it, agrees with that because those people push that. So you don't have to agree by your Words, you agree by your actions. We're calling that which God calls an abomination. We'll begin to appreciate and esteem that. I say that we ought to let God touch our minds. Touch our hearts. Lord calls me to fall out with what you've fallen out with. God calls me to despise what you despise. 
God called me to loathe what you loathe. God called me to love what you love. I don't want to have a mind to hold in high esteem that which God calls detestable. Father, in Jesus' name, anoint us tonight to align ourselves with you. In the sanctuary and those who are watching, those who will hear this, help us, Lord. Align us with you. Give us to line up with the God of the Bible. Oh, God. Oh, God. Touch us, touch us, touch us. From the crown of our heads to the soles of our feet. Touch right now. Touch right now. Touch right now. Touch right now. Bring us in line with you. In the name of Jesus. For you are the Lord. You are God. And Lord, you are right. You are right. You are right. All of your ways are right. And they're pure and they're holy. And we need your help, Lord. We need your help. We need your help. Give us to see things through the lenses of the scripture. And as we study the scriptures, allow the scriptures to become us. Let the scriptures be revealed in the way we talk and in the way we think. And even in our uh, down talk, may we quote scripture and let it, even when we're not even thinking, Lord, let us, let us without thinking say, well, the Bible says this, and the Bible says that, and the Bible, the Bible. Let it become us, Lord, in the name of Jesus, that we not fall into the trap of holding in high esteem that which you have called a, an abomination in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. Touch us from the least to the greatest. Touch us, touch every babe in Christ. Touch every uh, mature believer. Touch us, Lord. Touch us, touch us tonight. Touch us tonight. Touch us tonight, Lord. We want you to touch us in a manner where we're changed from the inside out and from the outside in. In the name of Jesus. You're able to do it. You're able to do it, Lord. You're able. You're able. You're able. You're able. That unjust steward aligned himself with his Lord and his master. He aligned himself with the debtors. He aligned himself where everybody left happy. The rich man was happy. The debtors were happy. And he was happy. God, give us to align ourselves with you. That's where we find joy. And we will enrich the lives of others. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Give God praises.